Praise the Lord <clears throat> and welcome to yet another edition of our series of daily broadcasts which we have tagged <clears throat> the State of the Union. And by that we refer to the union between Jesus and his bride, the church. And we are still about the business of the word of the Lord saying, tell my people to return to me. The my people, of course, being the church. Return to him, of course, is a reference to a fuller dimension of the statement which says, the people for whom I died treat me as if I never went to the cross. They treat me as if I am irrelevant. Tell my people to return to me. And so since inception, we have been looking at one or the other expression of the provisions of God at the cross in the person of Jesus. And so more recently, we have been looking at the business at Easter. What did God do by Easter? And if you are joining us for the first time, please avail yourself of the recorded versions of the earlier editions of this series of broadcasts. They are available on Facebook and YouTube under my name, Eliaza Ulinfu. And so we began to look at three things which God did first at the Passover and then repeated essentially at Easter. He delivered us from a long-standing problem. He gave us a wealth transfer such that in Christ all that pertains to God now belongs to us by inheritance of course. And thirdly, he gave us a new dwelling place just like he started Israel off on the journey to the promised land. He gave us a new dwelling place in that we are now seated on the throne in Christ with God. And so we have started to look at each of these three dimensions of experience. God delivers from a long-standing problem. We have said that Easter is a season of warfare of sorts, a season of deliverance, a season of prosperity, all by the cross of Jesus. But if you don't know, you cannot appropriate it for yourself. You cannot bring it to bear in your circumstance. So the unbeliever is still an unbeliever, not because Jesus didn't die for him, but because he has not been brought face to face with that truth, and then in a manner that he can understand and accept it for himself. And that truth remains, even with the believer, in several different dimensions. You succeed to the degree of what you know, what has been provided in Christ. And so we have been looking at the business of long-standing problems. God delivers by his word, and we receive that deliverance by a response in obedience to what God says, mixing the word of God with faith as Hebrew chapter 4 tells us. So today, let us look at two different dimensions of experience and how God delivers us from a long-standing problem. These problems are usually a matter of long-held positions of the mind, strongholds, especially from our, from our cultural background, 
or from this, those things which have been ingrained in us by reason of education. So a man is sick, a Christian is sick, and the first inclination is to go to the hospital. Nothing wrong with that. However, this is a long-standing position. Many of us grew up into it. You are sick, you face the hospital or the doctor, including Christians. Like I often say to people, imagine Jesus as we know him from the scriptures, sending somebody to the hospital. Imagine Jesus telling somebody, you know, you need to go and see a doctor. So what happened to Jesus in the church today? You see, one of the reasons he says, tell my people to return to me. When we return to him, Jesus we heal the sick like he did in the past. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. One of the provisions in the scripture where Jesus heals the sick, the Bible says that by his stripes we were healed. We were healed, not we are going to be healed, not we are healed, we were healed. In the past, we were already healed before we came on the scene. We were already healed before we became sick. But it will take a position of understanding in the scriptures to operate by that. And so herein is our first example of deliverance from a long-standing situation. In fact, a stronghold by the word of God. You know, the word of God says that by the Holy Spirit, God is with us and in us. So one time I developed what I imagined was a terrible stomach problem. I was far away from home. I was far away from anywhere that could be convenient. But I was suddenly sick. I found myself a quiet place to pray. But nothing happened. So I called home. I called my wife. This is what is happening to me. I'm on my way home. Please begin to pray. And so I got home and we teamed up and prayed. I was in excruciating pain. I'm a doctor. I know the way to the hospital. But I also know what the Bible says. And so I lay on the bed. I was trying to take a nap. But I wasn't napping anywhere because of this excruciating pain in my abdomen. It was like my intestines were twisting. So quietly I said to the Lord, Lord, can you please heal me? Can you please heal me? And he said, I healed you the first time you asked. I healed you the first time you asked. Now we might want to add, I healed you when you and your wife joined together to pray. Because he says, in the power of two will do greater things. But he said, I healed you when you the first time you asked. Just like he said to Daniel, I answered you from the moment you began to pray. The angel is telling Daniel, I was sent with the answer to your prayer the moment you began to pray. But I was held back, I was hindered by the Prince of Persia. 
but now I am called. You see, God says, tell my people to return to me. When we return to him, certain positions of scripture will begin to come alive. One such position of scripture, besides the fact that we were already healed before we got sick, he says, I healed you the first time you asked. And you would think, why do I still feel the pain? Because God calls those things that are not as though they are. The long-standing problem in this case, the stronghold of our mind in this case, is that we walk by sight. We walk by how we feel. So until we feel healed, we don't believe we're healed. He said, I healed you the first time you asked. Is he deaf? No. He heard me when I prayed the very first time. Why could I not experience the healing in my body? Because when I prayed, I could not mix it. I did not mix it with faith. Faith how? When you pray according to his will, he knows. He said, know that I have heard you. And if you know that I have heard you, know that you have what you are asking for. Now that's going to take a lot of courage and a lot of faith, especially in the face of an excruciating pain. Is it his will to heal me? Yes! If it wasn't his will, he wouldn't have healed me by the stripes of Jesus anyway. He said the moment you asked, it was a done deal. Why? I heard you when you asked. And if you know that I heard you, then know that you have what you're asking for. So I said, okay, Lord, I see that now. Can you please just give me some sleep? After all, you said you give your beloved sleep. Give me some sleep. I want to take a nap. When I woke up from that nap, the pain was as far away from New York City as New Zealand is as far from New York City. As far as heaven is from the earth, that was how the pain was far from me. The pain was gone. He said, I healed you when you asked. But until we come to the place of operating by the word of God, we will continue to operate by sight. We will continue to operate on the basis of how we feel. Now that's the first one. He says, tell my people to return to me. There are provisions in God written in the book. There are provisions which, which we come to just by fellowship with him. But first, we have to return. Now, I'll, I'll give a second example. I had a dream. I had a dream that I was lying down beside an ant hill. And those ants had come out from, the, from, the, from their base. And they were swarming all over me. I'm lying on the floor. I'm sleeping right next to an anthill. I am dreaming this because when I woke up, I realized it was a dream. Now, I can imagine up to a million ants were all over me. And all that would be required was for one of them to sting me. And I imagine the rest would go into a frenzy as I reacted to the sting. And I woke up. I said, okay, noted. Let me have some sleep. So I went back to sleep. Not quite five minutes later, I had woken up again because I had just experienced a second dream. Now, in the second dream, again, I'm lying on the ground, and this time, a cobra was sitting on my chest, ready to strike, face to face. I woke up like that. What? Now, when I joined this second dream with the first one, I realized it's time to get up, it's time to pray. Now, answer this question for me. What made it time to pray? Think about it. Why did I get up from the bed with the mind it is time to pray? These two dreams must mean something. 
what teaching in the Bible says that if you have a bad dream, you should go and pray. It's a mindset which we have developed from fear. I'll explain myself. Many of us are afraid of certain dreams. Many of us interpret certain experiences from a negative point of view. So we are afraid, for example, of spiritual attacks by dreams. Some of us are afraid of being initiated into the occult through dreams. Yet others are afraid of eating in a dream. We have all kinds of fears. Now these fears have created strongholds in our minds and then we operate from these strongholds and so they become long standing problems. They become long held positions. And our cultural backgrounds and cultural settings, especially for those of us with African origins, but we don't realize or we don't recognize them for what they are. They are called strongholds, created by fear. Or if you like, the devil has used fear as the building block to strengthen those positions of our minds. So I woke up and I decided it's time to pray. I hope we understand that that prayer was fear-based. Fear-based, not faith-based, fear-based. First, it was one million ants. The next thing, King Cobra is sitting on my chest, waiting for me to blink so that he can strike. It's time to pray. Maybe God is trying to show me something. That's something else we see. So I began to pray. I began to pray what we call hot prayer. I began to pray. And as I started to pray, I heard somebody telling me, shut up. And I refused. Why would I shut up? Didn't you see those dreams? They are scary enough. So I deepened the prayer. My voice became louder. And then quietly I heard, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I said, yes! God has given me a scripture with which to pray. I began to pray that scripture. No I said, devil, hear ye the word of the Lord. No weapon fashioned against me can prosper. And I really thought I was praying. I really thought I was praying. And many of us do too. It was just an exercise in fear. And the Lord was simply trying to quieten me by telling me, shut up. And I simply refused because I thought it was the devil trying to stop me from praying. And finally, somehow the Holy Spirit managed to get across to me. I said, no weapon fashioned against you can prosper. And then I got it. Even if indeed the devil is up to something funny in your dream, I already said no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. How many of us operate from the position of that piece of scripture? And I'm going to read it to us shortly. He says, from Isaiah chapter 54, reading verses 16 and 17. Behold, I have created the smith and the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. Verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Now that night, or early morning, 
as I realized that the Lord was trying to tell me, they can't do anything to you. I already said no weapon fashion begins to can prosper. As I realized that, I ran straight to the scripture to look at the word as it is written. No weapon fashioned against thee shall prosper. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Now, it is very easy to say, I am not a servant of the Lord. So that scripture does not apply to me. It's very easy to say that. It's very easy for a believer to say, it doesn't apply to me, I'm not a servant of the Lord. It was easy for him to say that to you, you are a servant of the Lord. I agree I'm a servant of the Lord. But in you saying you are not a servant of the Lord is the error. Who told you that? Who told you you are not a servant of the Lord and therefore that provision of scripture is not for you? Romans chapter 6 verse 17. For God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. Being then freed from sin in the death of Jesus, you became servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Can you still say you are not a servant of God? Or you are not a servant of the Lord? The moment you made Jesus your Lord and Savior, <clears throat> you necessarily became his servant. Why? Lord means the one to be obeyed. He said, you call me Lord, Lord, but you won't do what I say. In other words, the, we are supposed to do what the Lord says. If he is Lord, then we are servants. We do what he says. So as servants of the Lord, every Christian, as servants of the Lord, the Bible says, no weapon fashioned against you can prosper. So where did we get this fear of our dreams from? A long-standing problem of unbelief, which has become a stronghold, foiled by what we have heard, perhaps from previous occultic practitioners. And I'll close with this because my time is fast spent. You know, back in the day, we were told, we were told by those who used to be practicing witches and wizards, we were told that their time of activity at night was between 12 midnight and 4 a.m that by around 4 a.m. they will be returning home from wherever they have been. Let's say they are covered. Wherever they've been, whatever they've been up to. By 4 a.m. they will be having to return home, wherever home meant to them at that moment. Now, because of this revelation, Christians began to intensify prayers between 12 midnight and 4 a.m not because of the night watches in Israel, but because of what witches and wizards who had become Christians were telling us. Otherwise, what scripture in the Bible tells us that evil is most potent between 12 midnight and 4 a.m.? Which scripture tells us that night prayer is stronger than daytime prayer? Really? And so one of us took the matter to the Lord. And this is the explanation that came from the Lord. He said, those witches and wizards who gave you people that information, where are they coming from? The kingdom of darkness. So people who are coming from the kingdom of darkness, ruled by the father of lies, they are telling you what they used to do in the kingdom of lies and lying. 
and you believe what they are saying. Don't you understand that what they are saying is as they were deceived also by their master, the father of lies? So we were basing our praying and prayers and fears on lies from the kingdom of lies. You see that now? How can any truth come from the kingdom of lies? He is the father of lies. He has nothing else to say but lies. His minions cannot tell the truth. So we based our fear of dreams. We based our fear of night time. Because we heard that witches and wizards operate the best somewhere between 12 midnight and 4 a.m. Who told you that? So a known liar tells you, I'll see you at 4 p.m. tomorrow, and you believe. Really? Those people said when they were serving the devil, this was how they used to operate. Are we supposed to operate by what people coming from the kingdom of darkness are telling us? Or rather from what the word of God, the kingdom of light, is saying? Now this is how the word of God delivers from strongholds, long-held positions of deception, long-standing problems. But you see, he says, tell my people to return. It's time to be delivered from some of these things. And this deliverance is founded on something God did at Easter. That's why we're talking about it at Easter. That's why we're talking about it as an offshoot of Easter. What happened at Easter? Jesus delivered us from a long-standing problem. And that positioned us to benefit from deliverance to several other long-standing problems, strongholds under which we have operated up to now. I just gave a couple of examples. They are strongholds, never mind how your brain wants to interpret them. Anything that you have automatically done because that is how you have believed it for a long time becomes a stronghold. Unless it is founded on the word of God. Even at that, it is still a stronghold. It's just that it's a stronghold of the word of God. He says, tell my people to return to me. There are strongholds to be broken. There are strongholds to be delivered from. We must escape the snare of the fowler so that the liberty which was, which was procured for us by Christ at Easter be fulfilled in us, in our experience of Christ. We'll do some of this again tomorrow, same time. But let us keep in mind the word of the Lord. Tell my people to return to me. There is deliverance in Christ from things you may not even have imagined until he shows it to you by his word. I'll see you again tomorrow. Stay blessed.